Right. Uh, hello, thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, for those of you, there's no um, introduction to AWE in this presentation. So if anybody's uh, not familiar with the site and what we do, uh, we do have a new website that's just come out. It looks extremely professional. So it would be great if we get lots of hits. Um, uh, by the way, it also has uh, jobs uh, vacancies as well, just in case uh, anybody's interested in that. Right, I'd just like to uh, start with a few apologies uh, for reading this presentation so formally. Uh, it, it, it is a security vetted presentation, so I am quite limited in, in how I approach it. And I have to do that ages ago, so I've forgotten all the quips, so my, my comic timing will be completely out. Um, and I'll be reading from some of the pages, which are, uh, some of the views, which is a little bit boring, I know. Uh, secondly, of course, my, my voice lacks all the higher frequencies associated with normal human speech. So if I start mumbling a little bit and it goes a bit like this, then just wave vigorously and, uh, and I'll try and speak up. Uh, our presentations today are described in the leaflet in terms of offering answers to those who may wish to attend. So uh, this is the, pro this is the um, problem I'm answering, that commercial realities often result in companies taking on challenges where only a few of their ch staff, for instance the uh, head of engineering, uh, is truly qualified and experienced. What does a practical engineer have to know to be able to face the challenge of nuclear lifting? Uh, now in doing this, I'm deliberately pitching below the level of understanding of most of the delegates here. If you fundamentally d disagree with a the point, then speak out, and we will try to capture the breadth of experience present, uh, rather than my limited and specific experience. Uh, and this presentation is very much my personal opinion, and reflects only my environment, which is really quite different to the one we've just seen now. Right, so what is suitably qualified and experienced? Well, firstly, the engineer must have a knowledge of kinematics sufficient to produce substantiation. Now, substantiation is the word we use for sums to make them sound more nuclear. <laughs> so, I would like uh, an applicant to have passed a hard maths exam and to have a demonstrable ability to guide and understand the output of specialist analysts who, you know, they know their stuff, but they don't know your design. I would also like extensive experience designing similar equipment. These are very complex machines with long lives, so you need 20 years to learn if they're good and to learn from your mistakes. I would suggest some of the examples today have actually shown us you only know it was a good design when you come to take it apart and realise you can't. Um, also, a master understands how others ply their trade, so a broad understanding of relative alternative standards is vital, and also an understanding of those tiny little details that undermine uh, an otherwise soundly based design. This is especially valid as the British baseline for nuclear lifting consists of machines that are generations old. And knowledge of uh, production technology and assurance is a given. Again, that, may be that is specialist to, the, to our industry. Now, who feels they fully satisfy this description? Well, I am kind of hoping there'd be one or two of you actually, but there's none. There's none, right. That means you're all under this uh, application. You're all a practical engineer. So now, um, if I consider this meaning, many might say there is no place for this person in the nuclear industry. Pause to see who laughs and who does not, and who does both. I cannot, if... Uh, now, what attributes might the practical engineer have? Now, I, I can't teach this kind of stuff if you were working for me. <coughs> You've got to have it on day one when you turn up. Really good stuff, a good ability for maths and English. It requires talent and commitment from the individual over many years, and I'd urge you to, to pursue your skills in this. But these skills aren't unique to the nuclear industry. It's preferable that you have the knowledge of a machinery designer. Now, that can be crammed into a few years, traditionally it would have been eight or ten as a result of a craft and draftsman apprenticeship, but a modern graduate will have to learn faster. Machinery design, manufacturing techniques, drafting as opposed to PowerPoint, machinery safety, again this is not a unique skill set. 
If you don't have all these attributes on this list, then you know where your CPD needs to focus. And you don't have to wave your hands at this point. Right, definitions. What are we talking about today? Well, uh, a layman might define deterministic as a long adjective applied to various activities without any qualification or specific definition in order to sound more nuclear. You think I'm being glib, do a word search on some of the stuff from the ONR and just don't tell them that I told you to do that. Now this is not to be confused with determinism the normal or the normal definition, which is the philosophical doctrine whereby all events, including human action, are determined by pre-existing causes external to the will of the person concerned which includes your motivation. Also, if you do a Google search, I've found that there's a process taught by American universities where they have requirements and design reviews. I'm definitely not talking about that. Now, I'm talking about the bit at the bottom. The act of design which employs the philosophy whereby all events are determined by design and consequently addressed in the design, such that the equipment and its operation are demonstrably and appropriately safe. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, design basis much because the part of this philosophy is if it's beyond the design basis or a margin beyond the design basis, there is some element of failure. And we're not really interested in failure, we're more interested in success. <coughs> so, I've said, how did it do that? I was on that, right. I've said that events are determined by design. Yes, they are. No, no surprise there, then, because you've just seen the slide. Right. Gravity is fixed. It's on Earth. You chose the planet. Some guys from NASA have decided to, you know, buck the trend on that and land on a, land on a comet instead, so I think that's quite topical, quite frankly. Earthquakes, floods, rain and lightning happen. You chose the environment. You designed the rest. Now, that's a bit sad because, of course, Fukushima's also told us a lot of, taught a lot about choosing your environment. Um... The things you design are antecedent sufficient causes of the events that happen next. Events we don't like, and possibly, and in some definitions that does include environmental, we call fault scenarios. These happen because we fail to identify and design them out, or the mitigations we do design fail. If you focus on the failure modes, you, when you design something, you will understand it better and instinctively improve its safety. Get this into your head and you are ahead of the game. I'll say that again. You as the designer design the failure modes. You determine what can happen and therefore what does happen. Now many designers just want to use standard design approaches and hope it can be substantiated and hope that things won't happen. That just isn't acceptable anymore. It probably was 10 years ago but the world's <coughs> moved on. Now, about covering environmental events quickly. Does everyone accept that the solution to wind and rain is walls and a roof? Yeah, that's good, yeah. After an earthquake and your house collapses, where will you spend the night? In your car. Now, no laughs in my car. If, you, if, you, if those of you who are into finite element analysis will have instantly recognised this is a useless car. It has no USB connection. Those of you who are really old will recognise it has no wheels, but who needs wheels? Because it has got no sat nav, so you'll get lost anyhow, won't you? Uh, this is a structural car. It is a structural cell isolated by springs, hence its resistance to force is hugely in excess of seismic events. Formula One cars, round the bend, 5G. Who's been talking about 5G for seismic recently? No one round here. Therefore, it makes sense that a good basis for safe operations is an isolated slab. In a qualified building, of course. Oh, look, we've dealt with the floods too, because we're now a little bit higher. That's a really good age of we joke that. We just cringe when we hear that one, but don't worry, there's less about that. Now, we're out of real stuff. This is a real machine. It's a very, very good one at that. We had a requirement to move a payload between workstations. The hazard assessment determined it was class one nuclear hazard. 
The optioneering selects a sky hook with two axis motion up, down and along, uh, highly driven by the safety requirements of the interface and equipment and the process to be, to be done. This wasn't something that we could get away with a, a something other than a sky hook and still be able to perform properly. In designing it, it became optimised for access to the working area under the hook because, like I say, it's a complex process and needs lots of space. But it's also constrained by the size of room and the lightning standoff, which it shouldn't have been, but, you know, you know, civil engineers are like, they like to build the place, don't they? Um, this results in this disadvantageous cantilever. I don't like cantilevers, OK, because you get a nodding woodpecker. They're very bad things, but we've got one anyhow. Not only that, but because it's a skyhook, we have all genetic, generic crane hazards available. And to make it worse, we've got no electricity allowed. There's no sill rated stuff on this crane. And uh, it, so it's manual. We decide for manual because we don't want any pneumatic no noise. And manual fault loads are very difficult to determine because uh, the normal ergonomic force that you put onto something for a fifth percentile woman is a tiny amount compared to a panicking 95th percentile man. Very, very tiny man. So how do we address this? Well, all the fault loads are basically bound using torque limiters. You can just about make out, oh, here's this fantastic thing. So a couple of uh, winding handles there, and they have uh, sometimes two torque limiters on them, so you can only wind a certain amount of force. And this defines the loading input into each transmission and it limits the acceleration uh, and the end stop impact. So you wind down as fast as it will let you go, you're still not fast enough to do any harm when you get to the end. Well notice it also has dual load path mechanisms. That's becoming very much a, a sort of industry standard normal thing. Now in the event of rope failure, um, there's a, a balance compensator to keep both ropes ten, ten, uh, tense and uh, that has a damper on it. So if it moves too quickly, the damper helps reduce the impact. But it could actually fall off completely. Uh, and it wouldn't be a problem because its impact with the uh, constraining steelwork is uh, controlled, it's by design, and uh, it's designed to be safe. Now, the principal hazards in cranes of impacts snags, hangman's drop, uh, uh, snag drag as well, uh, are addressed robustly through a uh, mechanical interlock, which in this case is controlled by castellated keys, uh, mainly to allow uh, interfacing with other equipment, uh, uh, but also because we couldn't, we, there's so much mechanism in there, you couldn't get all rods and linkages across. This system must be correctly aligned with the uh, identified workstation before allowing deployment of a positional locking pin. <coughs> Securing that locking pin enables the raised lower axis, which, uh, and that axis must be fully raised and locked to allow retraction of the pin to allow re traverse. So this system follows two rules of mechanical interlockery. It has, uh, you move through a locked safe state to, the, to allow the, the, the other motion or to, you know, or to the, the other thing that you want to do and you can always only move forward or backwards in your control cycle. You can't suddenly decide to do something grossly out of cycle apart from move to another workstation which is perfectly safe because you can only do that when you're fully raised. So you can't hit anything if you're doing that. So it's an enormously safe system. All the failure loads are dealt with very robustly. Everything's been calculated. Everything is very strong, and all the transmissions have a secondary load path. An awful lot, an awful lot of the structure has got a secondary load path as well. Only the jib itself is a single point failure, can lead to insult, and that is massively stiff and strong relative to the load. So this is a good example of thought of pretty much everything. We hope we've thought of everything. And everything has protection in depth. Now, most designs 
are shown to have a satisfactory strength by calculation against the conservative code. We've already discussed this a bit today. JSB 467 is applicable to the above example, which is mandated by the MOD explosive regulations, so there's no Euro codes in this presentation, I'm sorry to say. Now, engineers should not get hung up on codes that are a minimum requirement. The issue is, did you actually read the whole thing and identify the wisdom the writer intended, or have you misapplied it? Please remember to read the whole code when you think you're doing something in compliance with the code. Did you identify other parameters as requirements beyond the code? You'll be surprised how many come out of the woodwork. Now, a further consideration is whether the code hides the conservatism of the design. Because we keep adding little safety factors and cumulatively they can be very large. I've been told that most nuclear codes have a final safety factor of 7 to 10 against safe working load. However, proof loading is usually still the basic 1.25 or maybe 1.5 times safe working load, a figure that proves nothing. It will barely tension the ropes. Now, consider designing to the normal code, say 2573, or whatever of your choice, uh, but using three times your payload as the design load. So say I just start my calcs with that number. A proof test of the normal uh, value does not threaten to damage the machine as there's still margins against exceptional permissibles. A figure considered safe and used as an acceptable stress for survivable accidents such as buffer collision. Now at this point I should point out that these numbers which come out of our site standard are JSP exceptional permissibles with all the extra factors added in. That says there's an 0.6 on duty factor and a 1.5 impact factor. And that is a very, very conservative figure. So as a result, we get these huge margins. <coughs> so we're talking about five times on normal, normal safe working load. Well, about six times safe working load doesn't sound like a bigger margin. That's pretty normal for, for nuclear design. The previous design controlled the fault loadings, hence it can be tested in this manner. The result is empirical verification that the fault proof strength is achieved and hopefully confirmed for information that the expensive substantiation calculations were correct. You cannot achieve this without aggressive and comprehensive testing. Now here's a very simple example that does the job quite well. Servicing a furnace was identified as a manual handling risk, so it's a two-person lift and restricted access, good chance of injury. Risk of dropping the item and breaching containment to a low hazard radiological material has also been identified. Very important, someone's done some risk assessment, always a good idea. So uh, we decided to uh, we'd have a hoist and a rail system, but they come in quite large sizes relative to what we're looking at. So we've got basically a 500 kilogram off the shelf system. Uh, but we then reset the safe working load down to 100 kilograms. Uh, so it's a nicely above what we're actually going to pick up. We didn't regard uh, any special QA because it's a low hazard. You obviously you can argue that till the cows come home. The real point is that it's standard proof test was 12 times its payload. So I don't think anybody's going to argue that that's quite a robust system. Now, what is appropriate? This is actually quite a big field, uh, but it's very important that you understand that there's more than one way of looking at it. Firstly, there's proportionate to the mitigated consequences of failure. Assurance practitioners will have produced safety functional requirements for the lifting system classified based on the holistic system. For example, if a containment or a structure is inviolate, hence there's no release, they'll put next to no safety function requirement on the lifting equipment. And we've just seen a crane that was basically sealed in a box, so no one was really worried about what happened to the crane. There probably would be an issue if the crane was as strong as a bulldozer and had the ability to break out of the box, but that apparently wasn't the case. 
there is a, there is an argument that you should be proportionate a solution should be proportionate to the unmitigated consequence of failure and this is probably much more applicable to most nuclear nuclear lifting whereby the design is based on prescriptive levels of integrity considered appropriate to that nature of risk. Now, examples of this are the JSP we've been talking about, but also the NOG that we've talked about this morning. Someone very kindly managed to quote the German standards, um, and it's also French practice. Hence, it's very much relevant good practice, irrespective of what your assurance people tell you. Uh, those standards help to define the reasonable in ALARP. You should always ask yourself, wouldn't it be better not to have the event in the first place? And that will tell you what is the principal safety function is. And in my world, that's human beings doing a manual job, locked in a cell with <coughs> something that can kill them. And I think we should always take a lot of responsibility for that in our designs. Now here's an example that's actually in the first group. Uh, this store retrieval machine serves a matrix of storage cells uh, that contain robust containers. Now the risk of criticality is totally prevented by the storage structure, everything's simply too far apart. And there's also secondary nuclear safety measures in the strength of the containers. So the demand on the machine is very, very modest. Uh, it could collapse, but that's that's successfully mitigated by the fact it, it has a very minimal height and it's collapsing onto a lot of concrete. So, that, so there's no problem there. It does have an SFR to prevent crush of, of the containers and there's an interlock vertical axis to stop a lot of accidents involved with that. But fundamentally, um, it has a, an SFR not to overcome the withstand of the containers and the containment of the, of the structure. And that works quite acceptable. I said another word, I said withstand. Right, this is a quite important. An item is considered safe if the threat is less than the withstand of the item it threatens with appropriate margins. So for instance, we're talking about crushing of a substantiated container, and we need to have margins to allow for integrity of both systems. So as integrity, integrity is sort of the reciprocal of the potential for error in design and execution. We've had a really good example here today that with the bolt, that um, it's actually incredibly easy to have a, a problem with the execution of your design. Um, the force mass has to be deterministic, uh, i.e. there must be assured means to limit the force. Remember, these are antecedent sufficient causes. If you get, if you put in a possibility of doing something, it can happen. So you've got to be really careful about that. I believe that withstand is a very valuable philosophy as it recognises the possibility of the fault and forces the designer to address it robustly. I think it's better than saying, I've done enough to prevent it happening, probably. But the real value is probably it gives us a goal to work to. It's a fundamental hard parameter that we can, we can take into account and quote directly in our calculations and it makes us as engineers feel better. So always look for that withstand and get it, get it screwed down. Now here's a very good example of risk assessment where withstand is of little help. Explosive manufacture involves volatile liquids whose vapours are prone to electrostatic ignition. So we want to apply ERIC PD. We can't eliminate the hazard. We can't reduce it to safe quantities. There's even a speck of high explosive is dangerous. It'll blow the end of your finger off, you know. It's hardly any to do that. So we have to isolate the personnel a very long way away. Now this robot is designed for paint spraying and has an established reliability in life that beggars belief in our context. It's, it's, it's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cycles without any problem, you know, it's a really good piece of kit. It does work to its full safe working load, so it's the biggest EX rated robot we could get. But it does get the people away from the process very well indeed. So here we've got um, <coughs> That's the robot, you can reach right out, pick up buckets, and sling them into this giant Kenwood Chef, which unfortunately isn't quite fully deterministic. It's got some safety braces there because uh, as it grew, as this, this mechanism, stirring mechanism grew, it became a little top heavy, which was really upsetting, quite frankly. But um, 
uh, that's how it works. My, my contribution, do you wonder what TAs do? They go to people and say, shouldn't that indicator look a little bit what, like what it's indicating? You see, so, you know, nice to know I made a contribution to that, wasn't it? Here you go. <coughs> right, I'm going to be really provocative now. Get rid of those seismic designers. Right, let's imagine, um, I, uh, right, remember that deterministic is philosophy, and I want, you, I want you to think in terms of philosophies. It's how you think about things. It's how your brain works. And we don't realise how our brains work half the time and we end up tripping over ourselves making mistakes. Right, let's see if this works. Right. Here's my PowerPoint standard eye section. Um, and in a lot of structural, uh, a lot of standards, you'll notice there's a nominal 10% horizontal loading put in the calculations. Now, no one does, bothers working out what the horizontal load is. It's 10%. It's a problem there. Well, of course, in seismic, it isn't. So let's just pretend that in this particular application, my seismic is uh, sort of 100% of whatever it is. Um, so, so it's a reasonably demanding one just for the sake of some maths. Well, a lot of the calculations I, will, I get, someone will add the extra seismic loading to the principal driver of the calculation. And uh, they'll just completely forget about the fact that it's, it's really it's the horizontal component that's a really big deal. Other people, like those I've just said, you got it wrong, will go, ah, of course, I've got to increase my horizontal to 100. Never mind about 100%, because this is now a real, a real load, right? Uh, but they're stuck in proportion. They, they, it's got to look right. So they start putting a lot of steel work in. And um, that's not wrong, but it could be problematical, like if you're paying the bill, or if, if it's now very stiff and it's got no compliance to, to deal with shock loads. So uh, if, that, if that's a crane beam, that's now a very stiff crane beam, it's got a difficult transmission. So the best solution is always designed to exactly what you're trying to achieve. So you've got both, both numbers are as they should be. Now, notice that looks a little bit more like a universal column, which, surprise, surprise, is a section that's designed with pretty much equal strength in all directions. And that's why I want you to think about seismic. Remember, you go back to my little car thing. It's something that's designed for forces in all directions. I think you need to think a little bit more 16-9 rather than, you know, 4-3. That's the way it needs to go. But I shouldn't be talking about I-beams at all. Because a lot of loads aren't through the centre of an I-beam, they're sat on top of it. And of course, with this horizontal thing, we now get whacking great moments. So what we should be doing, I should be telling it all to go to box sections. Because a box section quite often can be ten times torsionally more rigid than an I-beam of comparable weight and nominal size. And for this reason, uh, a lot of nuclear designs are often made with box sections because to give that horizontal strength. So here we've got a very simple design that's uh, quite good. The, the rail is right over on one area. It's well away from the welds, so you're not putting a high stress through, through any welds with propagation. And the impact from drop stops and uplifts, because remember that we always think what happens, what happens if something fails. So if the wheel drops off or, or the shaft snaps, We've got drop stops, and, uh, and they're actually away from the rail, so they don't, they're not close, so we're not adding hammering hammer blows to something that's actually at the, at the point of failure. Right, so now we don't want to have impact. I'm full of contradictions today, aren't I? Um, BS 466 says the end carriages and crabs shall be fitted with drop stops to prevent a drop of more than 25. The pride I get from designers when they come up to show the 25 millimetre drop that they've just engineered into their equipment. It's horrific. It's a long way to fall. It could even be your bounding load case if you've done a good job of all the rest. So please, please, please use the minimum possible drop with any straightness of track and wheel tolerance that is imposed upon you. And if you're designing it, design straighter track. Consider lateral roller guides, possibly preloaded 
we, we had them in some of the examples we had earlier. So that locks things to the wheel, to the rail. And use a full capture system that goes right round as much as possible, prevents uplift and any form of collapse. Because you might get a, a resonance or a, a response where things start hammering. It's, it's that hammer blow that breaks things and causes things to fall apart. So whenever you can, always dampen or elastically absorb energy transfer. So if I dampen, that could be plastic, for instance. It could be uh, hydraulics. I particularly like hydraulics, but a lot of people don't in radiological environments, but they tend to work well. Have I lost a page? <coughs> right, damage. Ductile design is a phrase used for designing structural failure in a plastic manner such that the collapse is progressive. So you get this sort of, a bit of sag, a bit of sag. As earthquakes have short durations, the energy can be absorbed by plastic deformation more easily than elastically resisting the event. Now, these USA codes are very useful um, against this kind of thing. And remember that California has real earthquakes. They have real devastating earthquakes. There are some parts of Europe that have but um, ASME have done a lot of work for it. Now, our Euro codes, which don't include nuclear design, are predicated on saving life, not maintaining functionality, which means that there's enough of the building left for you to get out of, and that's enough. That's not good enough for us. We've now got a, a lot of uh, radiological material that's now not contained, uh, sat in this building it's about to fall down so that wouldn't be good enough for that we would have we'd have to work on our our parameters to to make it a bit better than that so i suggest that designs should use ductile de design to extend collapse as far as possible until the building squashes it the functionality including the redu redundant recovery systems should be maintained as far as possible to allow removal of inventory from a failed containment now this may require some very clever modular design. We've seen some great design examples today. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. At last, they say, at last. Right. <laughs> Please remember that deterministic is jargon. It's changed its name, it's changed its interpretation over the last few years. Hence, it has a contextual and dynamic meaning. Please don't ask for, for absolute truths. This isn't a revelation, it's just the jargon. It's a philosophy of looking beyond a problem to identify and address everything that can go wrong. If you have any imagination, you should be good at it. But it helps be good at logic, maths and English. Ah, so what do you expect from a learning society? You know, there's a reason why you went to university, isn't there? Now, the principles are briefly illustrated. We've looked at mechanical isolation to control environmental inputs and fault loads. We've looked at the use of interlocks to control processes, hence mechanical loadings. We've looked at controlling fault loads. We've looked at testing above the fault loads to show that you can definitely sustain them. We've looked at the concept of withstand and how you need to control the fault loads. We've looked at avoiding common mistakes to ensure the integrity against the fault loads. And we've looked at avoiding impact to control fault loads. Uh, and we've also even using ductile design, so even if uh, so the strength is actually exceeded, we still control the, the, what we understand to be the fault load. So in two words, what's the summary of this presentation, Die? Fault loads! <laughs> control your fault loads, please. Right, thank you very much for listening.